Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. And this is episode number 645. That is 645 of the Agostino Zynga show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. And I hope you are doing well wherever this podcast may find you. I hope you are doing splendid. How am I? All things good. All things good on my end of the stick. All things good on my end of the stick. I haven't been getting up to much socially in terms of going out and stuff and hanging out and doing all that good and fun stuff. I've kind of been focusing on getting sure or making sure that I'm right, making sure that I'm going in the way that I need to go to in order for me to actualize all of my dreams and everything else going forward in this year. And especially considering such as such the meatiness of that New Year's resolution I put together, the first month of the year has been a bit of a write-off, so don't ask me about it. Just X that one off of the calendar, chook, chook, chook. But going into February and all the rest of the months coming up i'm going to be on it like sonic so if you see me online um kind of you know self-pleasuring myself with how awesome i may be posting about all the books i'm reading all the stuff i've been watching all the cool places i've been going all the stuff that i've been making um and all that malarkey please and posting my workouts and my runs all the times please do not get upset with me please do not unfollow me please do not block me please do not vomit in your own mouths or open the window and scream oh my god this guy's corny do not do that i beg of you i'm just trying to do what i know works for me and that is to peacock and to show off about how awesome i am despite some of my um, extracurricular activities and the debauch nature of it because there's something that i realize has been missing for a while because i stopped doing it for ages because i felt like it was a little bit like intellectual self-pleasuring replace self-pleasuring with that letter m and I, you know what i mean with the word that begins with m but i don't want to say it now in case youtube tries to demonetize me but it did feel a little bit like that when i used to post all the books i was reading in a month and learning languages and stuff that i was working on and projects i was about to launch blah 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 it did feel a little bit like i was intellectually mm, myself and you know i kind of had to censor myself and pull myself back but really and truly really and truly if i'm honest with myself and i am i try to be as honest with myself as possible and try to see all the pluses and the minuses and the pros and the cons in me and my character and my makeup the truth of the matter is i do enjoy that dopamine hit when people double tap my post where i'm trying to you know i'm signal that i'm smart i'm trying to can signal that i'm trying to do better i'm trying to signal that i'm trying to improve i'm trying to signal that i'm doing a little bit of sex self actualization i'm doing a bit of self inventory i'm digging deep i'm getting to the core of the issue and layering it bare and being honest and trying to address it and make right i love that dopamine hit of it these people are strangers they don't know me from a tin of paint for all they know i could be faking the funk and lying like a lot of people do out here i could be doing what those people do when they go to um you know people that get flipping spaces to go to flipping um to, to run the london marathon right i remember reading this article ages ago about it when i was getting really frustrated every time i keep entering the ballot to run the london marathon i'd never get in and then i read obviously that a lot of people that run sorry a lot of people that enter the ballot to get me you know to kind of rile me up even more I'm I'm sure somebody made this article with me in mind but this article basically said that there is a small number of people who when they get the confirmation email from virgin confirming that they are able to run the london marathon they share that little email because i think the email comes in a particular way where it kind of is a good thing to crop and to share online it's kind of you know uh designed in a certain way in terms of the layout and whatnot so it's quite cool because most of these emails when you get from races don't really look that great when you share them on your feed but this does look pretty sick you can kind of share it to your instagram or your social media straight away and some people the article said they get the dopamine hit already just from people liking that picture and those people don't even turn up so there is a small percentage of people Again, London Marathon is probably one of the most oversubscribed, in-demand races, long-distance ones in the world, I'd imagine, in terms of, you know, general normie type of people outside of all the obviously popular cross-country cross, um, ones. But London Marathon is definitely up there in terms of demand. And I read in this article, it boiled my blood, boiled my P-I-S-S, -S, that people don't turn up because they already got the dopamine hit from getting double taps on instagram because people already saw oh my god wow congrats grace congrats jamie congrats oliver congrats duncan congrats emma 
you are running the London Marathon, how great it is. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud. You know those, that saying as well that I absolutely hate. I'm so proud. I'm so proud. It's so flipping corny, so cheesy, so annoying because essentially it's like two people taking credit for doing nothing. It's a person, you know, signaling that they're doing, that they're going to do something and then people congratulating them and being proud of them because it's kind of a cool thing to see. Oh, my cool friend does X, Y, and Z. But you never see those same people who are saying I'm proud you know right i'm proud under a post of their friend saying they've now become the night shift manager at tesco's there's no proud about that there's no proud about you know going from working part-time as a retail staff to suddenly working part full-time and get rewarded with a contract no proud of that there's no proud there's no proud of being able to find a flipping babysitter to look after kids so you can go out nothing is proud about that but when it comes to something involving you know something cool oh my god you got tickets to glass and oh my god you're going to london man suddenly everyone's proud get out of here so but going back to myself going back to me i realized over the last few months that despite me not wanting to post these things online i do it anyway even if i'm not posting on instagram i'm posting on twitter so i'm doing it kind of in the same way but i do kind of crave and need that sort of um confirmation or reaffirmation that i'm on the right track and people are people that i think that people that i think are doing good are also impressed by how what i'm trying to do and where i'm trying to go and because i know i'm sick deep down anyway and i know i've kind of got a good head on my shoulders even though i have my fables i have my errors i have my missteps for the most part i think i'm generally a decent enough type of guy even though i'm sure some people would disagree which is okay you're, you're okay to disagree we've all got our own differences how we view yourselves but how i see myself in the mirror i know that i've got potential but still sometimes you can get just lost in the weeds lost in the source and we're going to talk about that later we've got a good topic to talk about getting lost in the source but sometimes you can get lost in the source and i feel like when i do get lost in the source a good way to kind of center myself and give myself accountability as well that's another thing you mentioned social media gives me accountability because if i'm posting about going on a run or posting bragging about what time i woke up it makes me motivated to do it again a second, you know, a second time, a third time, a fourth time, wherever. I want to keep that chain going on. And I remember there was a, who was it? I forgot his name. Um, there was a comedian that said something along the lines of him when he's writing. Yeah, I think a comedian says something along the lines of when he's writing material, he tries to keep that in mind where he does don't break the chain. So he just tries to keep that in mind. So he doesn't want to reset again. So he kind of tries to go and make sure that he's doing at least one bit of writing whether it's on stage or actually sitting down and physically writing a joke every single day and it's not not it's nothing it could just be like a one-liner it can be whatever it may be but just writing something just to kind of keep the brain ticking over so then then off the back of that consistency you would hope that that's when the bright spark of you creating like a major production will come from because you'd imagine those little things that you do every single day really make the difference as opposed to like the big things that you decide to do out of the blue so in short if you do see an outpouring or an increase of me posting online concerning this cool stuff that I'm doing, where I'm legitimately trying to give myself fellatio, do not, do not be alarmed. Do not unfollow me. Do not block me. Do not open a window and scream. Oh my God, this guy's R worded and super lame. Like enough. Don't do that. Just understand and accept that I'm trying to better myself. I'm doing a little bit of self inventory. I'm really trying to get to the weeds of issues and trying to pull out all the dead ones and trying to make sure that I'm planting good seeds in there so I can regrow stronger and much more um, alive and much more alert and much more ready to take on whatever I need to take on this year because i'm sure this year although it's going to be good there's going to be some sprinklings of amazingness along the way i've got a feeling it's going to be full of challenges so i need to kind of condition myself in the beginning of this year i think i've got my fingers kind of dry but i need to condition myself in the beginning of this year when things are a little bit quiet and there aren't many distractions going on around town and whatnot and trying to get myself nice and conditioned nice and tough nice and mentally you know all there so that when the challenges do come up along the year that i'm kind of anticipating coming up but again nothing too big nothing crazy you know regular life challenges i've just got a feeling that this year is going to be one of those ones that i need to make sure that i'm ready conditioned so that i can attack them and i can make sure that i can deal with them um in the best way possible that's a, what all you can do really when it comes to these sort of issues you're not going to be perfect you're going to respond to them all the best way but as long as i can keep up myself on some level then i'll be okay going forward that's the plan that is a plan but actually in you know when you think of all these things and again it's just me right thinking about this sort of stuff so there's a lot of self-speak a lot of kind of self um inventory a lot of self actualization no, yeah, a lot of self-inventory a lot of just reflection 
you can kind of get wrapped up in that whole thing and think, oh my God, it's me, 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 me. But then all it takes is one really, really, really disastrous and shocking story to suddenly get snapped out of it and you're realizing, God damn it, if I thought my life was hard, just imagine how much harder it is for these people who've just kind of been, you know, their whole lives have been turned completely upside down just in the blink of an eye. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's regarding the latest what's going on in Turkey and Syria regarding the earthquakes. And from what I've been reading lately now online and according to this BBC article, they're already accounting 3,500 people have passed. 3,500 people have passed in the last, what, 24 hours, 48 hours or so? And again, this is something that happened just recently. Um, something that happened, I, I would say out of the blue because there were some warnings here and there that people were kind of alerting some people to here and there. You can see there's a trail of people online, especially on Twitter, who were kind of saying that they were anticipating some sort of seismic um, event happening across that region of Turkey and Syria for a while. But the fact that people's lives have been turned upside down in the blink of an eye and now more than 3,500 people have lost their lives is absolutely shocking. Of course, to me, the only reason why I was really alerted to the situation was because it impacted footballers. And I think, unfortunately, one footballer has been confirmed now to have passed away. This is a confirmed death of a goalkeeper from a team called Malatis. Malatiaspor and the goalkeeper has unfortunately passed away and the another one I think was a Ghanaian midfielder he's been found I think um, I think his name is Atsu I think they found him but this guy called um, Yeni sorry this this goalkeeper called Iyup Tokaslan Tokaslan following the earthquakes of Turkey his lifeless body was found under the rubble and the really shocking part about this obviously RIP to this Turkish goalkeeper like really really sad and um, I really thought so for his going to his family the other thing that's really touching about it, so I kind of really thought about was the area of London that I'm in um oh my god the area of London that I'm in is um predominantly there's a lot of Turkish people in my area so I can imagine a lot of people in my area and my ends in East London have definitely been touched by this in the personal and you know um, level um, directly i'm sure some people unfortunately will have family and friends and relatives and extended family and fam friends and friends and friends of whatever who have been impacted by this there's no way shape or form that i cannot un understand it so i i can only i can only imagine what they're going through especially being so far away maybe being unable to travel there maybe travel has been suspended to go to places like that especially when you consider you know the magnitude of what's happened it's just absolutely scary, man, to think this was happening. And again, this is just me coming off the back of ranting for seven minutes, eight minutes about me posting more books I'm reading and being all wrapped up in my own self and what I've got going on. All it takes is one tragedy at least so you just suddenly realise that, you know, for all the issues that you're going through, life really isn't that bad, you know, especially in the UK. We don't really have issues like earthquakes um, too often. Um, and these are not some things we have to kind of keep in the back of our minds to be worried about in the slightest. Uh, like, okay, cool. So, okay, rises. Okay. So they've got the official toll here. They're saying, okay, this is earlier or is this now? Okay, I don't know what is happening now. But anyway, summary so far from BBC, I'll read out to you. It says a rescue operation is underway across much of southern Turkey and northern Syria following a huge earthquake that has killed at least 3,500 people. The 7.8 magnitude quake struck near um, Gazamtep. Gaziantip in the early hours of Monday while people were asleep. So just imagine how that scary that must have been. The 7.5 magnitude tremor then hit around for, um around uh, 1 30 p.m local time which officials said was not an aftershock the country's disaster agency says more than 2,900 people were killed in turkey alone okay cool so this is saying across turkey and syria it's 3,500 but they're already approaching 3,000 in turkey alone oh my god um after the first quake and more than 1 15,000 were injured and i can imagine this as well similar to what happened in covid because if you remember the early days of COVID when it hit it well, sorry, when it hit Europe for the first time and obviously ravished through parts of Italy and Spain, the reason why some of the numbers were so astronomically high was because in that if I'm not me for again, this is just me talking out of my ass, but if I'm not mistaken, the reason why it was so astronomically high at that time is because in those regions, especially Mediterranean countries, a lot of extended families live in the same houses or sometimes the same buildings. And some of them people are really elderly. And, you know, if something like COVID strikes and it obviously if negative affects elderly people, you can just imagine the amount of people it's getting passed to. And they usually, and again, sorry, elderly people, and they usually kind of talk a lot 
amongst each other they hang out with them a lot they go to local cafes there's a lot of kind of like you know a community kind of vibe around it so that's why when covid struck it hit a lot of people quickly and it took them out very quickly too and i can only imagine with an earthquake in a place like turkey where a lot of family members are living in the same household and you know some people yeah a lot of family, maybe over over you know over full of people you know there's many not many space and whatnot and then the earthquake happens, you can just imagine the amount of people that it can take out quite quickly. Um, so I can't even, you know, I can't even fathom how that was being to, you know, to live through that in a flipping real time. It continues here. More than 1,400 people are reported to have died in Syria. Rescuers are racing to save people trapped beneath the rubble after thousands of buildings collapsing in both countries. Countries including the US and South Korea are sending aid after Turkey issued an international plea for help. And uh, this is titled as flipping horrifying. It says, courtesy of BBC, they're calling out, but we can't save them. Freezing temperatures, snow and rain have hampered the uh, search efforts for survivors through the night in Turkey as those trapped in the debris cry out for help. One man in, in Hatay, a province in Turkey's south, wept in the rain as he described to writers the agonizing wait for rescuers. They're making noises, but nobody is coming, Dennis said, at times wringing his hands in despair. We've dev we're devastated. My God, they're calling out. They're saying, save us, but we can't save them. There's been nobody since the morning. Meanwhile, in Syria, Ra Raid al Sali of the White Element or the White Helmets, a rescue service of the rebel held territory, said that there was a race against time to save the lives of those under the rubble. Bloody hell. Absolutely incredible. There's obviously, I'm not going to show that. Um, and then, of course, the more updates here. Um, it says, yeah, uh, rescue teams from around the world are originally being deployed. A number of people whose apartments were destroyed are spending the night at the streets in nearby freezing temperatures. Some of them have gathered near campfires to keep warm. Thousands of buildings have collapsed after the 7.8 magnitude quake. So imagine they've all been made homeless just in a blink of an eye. And they're now out in the streets, gathered around campfires. And again, there's nowhere to go because the whole area has been absolutely ravished by these flipping earthquakes. You know, there's, look at these people, hundreds of crowds at Istanbul airport jesus trying to leave i'm assuming oh my gosh just rubble everywhere so for everything going on wrong with me at the moment and for what i've kind of been feeling in terms of maybe not doing the things i need to be doing in order to kind of get my life where it needs to be you need to kind of realize it that things are far things could be worse you know things could definitely be worse and i can just only imagine what life must be like in turkey now you know especially in the regions that have been hit with this earthquake while well, i remember you're living a really quiet normal you know going through the motions existence and then suddenly your life gets turned upside down through no fault of your own and now you're essentially homeless gathered around a campfire with people waiting for aid that may come may never come may come late and just uncertain of your future going forward i can only imagine man so force of feelings guys everybody in turkey who's negatively affected by that i can only imagine i can only imagine quickly moving on from that just to quickly talk touch this because i've had a few people you know nice enough to reach out and say oh my god i guess you know you are right well done good prediction to be fair i'm not going to take that much credit for this but this is just a story i want to quickly cover this is regarding this um exclusive bit of information i guess courtesy of high snobiety regarding daniel lee's new vision of burberry that should be debuting i think this up and coming um new york uh, london fashion yeah there we go um lee has shared a debut campaign as creative director of the house ahead of his presenting his first collection for the house creative director um at london fashion week later this month so as most of you guys will know i've been speaking a bit a little bit about daniel lee and his kind of ups and downs when it comes to him being at Bottega veneta and the scandal around that with him allegedly saying something racist in a in a meeting that the fashion industry kind of swept under the rug to be honest so i i want to i to be fair i'm not really for cancel culture i've always said that in the slight in the first place i'm more of a fan of fans canceling people so if fans decide hey we've had enough of you we don't like what you stand for or what you who you are now and they decide to back away from somebody fair enough but i've always been a bit hesitant to kind of get behind organ to get behind like mass cancellations when organizations and platforms and publications are deciding to pull away from somebody and be the moral moral arbiters for society at large i think we should decide that ourselves and uh, you know for better or worse and i don't think it should be these places because essentially we've all got our own little weird skeletons in our closet and essentially you're kind of you know you're deciding what is what is less worse basically between certain people and i think especially in fashion we should know, know especially if you're a real fashion head you know there's a lot of people in the industry that have very questionable histories or have done things very questionably before and maybe they should be cancelled too if you kind of look at what people have been cancelled for nowadays so in fact 
just you know rule out cancelling all, all together but what i was very interested by was the fact that there was no real repercussions it felt like for what he allegedly may or may not have done if anything more people came after the guy who leaked the news and obviously his credibility was kind of you know thrown you know into question because i think he was also the same guy that came out and said rocky was cheating on rihanna and and that was you know um that was kind of a dismissed as fake news and people didn't say that was legit so loads of things happened around that but anyway regardless he kind of came out of it unscathed he went away sat down did some yoga um hooked up with some amazing as he amazing looking flipping ballet dancer who's ripped and jacked and tall and handsome as hell i forgot what his name is um essentially but he's took that time away to kind of center himself get hooked up with a really good looking dude get himself a nice apartment or house here in london and then he got appointed as a creative director of burberry once ricardo tishi unfortunately got told to skedazzle and when the news broke at first i was initially saying that i anticipate the new version of burberry to be quite similar to what he was doing at Bottega Veneta when he was really leaning into this whole like I have black friends thing um you know kind of you could say pandering but it just felt like he was trying to catch a vibe trying to catch a momentum he's basically was doing what Simon Port Jack Moose is doing now where he's essentially discovered that black people exist and cool ones and now he's essentially you know revived his brand when I felt like his brand was dying and was kind of going the same way that most of these kind of you know aspirational waspy um french villagey type things were going because for the most part i remember jack moose was m a lot of the inspiration around jack moose was him getting inspired by friends of his mom if i remember correctly reading old reviews it was like his mom's friends and the ladies around his family and stuff in this you know small idyllic villages with you know really cute people running around wearing flipping pinstripe and no socks and espadrilles and shit right that's the kind of vibe i can imagine but after a while that kind of gets boring and i felt like had a bit of a lull period especially around the time the whole acgs were coming out like you know that nike acg collection no one's talking about it anymore it kind of it been and went it was pretty terrible if or if all you know all things considered it didn't even make any sense why jack moose was doing an acg collection of all things like i don't ever see an acg girl, i don't ever see a jack moose girl going flipping um bouldering let alone going on hikes or running and stuff that's not happening jack moose girls don't run they just you know they drink tequila and they flip in intermittent fast for the most part but they're not kind of they're not bouldering or hiking or anything anyway I did expect Daniel Lee to do the same thing, you know, to kind of continue what he was doing because it, it worked pretty well towards the end. There was a really cool activation or showcase he did at Bottega Veneta at Bergheim during the midst of the p flipping pandemic again. Daniel Lee's got away with murder, you know, just in life in general. Just imagine, like, he did a flipping fashion show in the mid in the middle of the pandemic at Bergheim, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was a full after party with Virgil DJing RIP. I'm pretty sure that happened maybe it happened in um what's that thing called ah oh, what's that place called there's a whatever um members club in berlin i think it was it took place over there but you know there was a lot of kind of hype around that i think burner boy was there skepta was there virgil of course was there rip and a few other people so clearly that was working him basically touching upon these cultural icons of the moment who are really kind of hot like fish grease and everyone's big fans of them and it makes sense to kind of carry that forward and clearly Daniel Lee's doing this with Burberry going forward. So this is courtesy of High Society. Obviously, he shared it already on his page. But some of the images here, most of them are taken by the iconic and very underrated um, fashion photographer, or photographer in general, Tyron Le Bon, who I mostly know from his work with Stussy, but definitely somebody who I feel like doesn't get a prep, the praise or props that he probably should deserve. But if you're looking at the imagery, it does remind me a lot of what he was doing at Bottega Veneta towards the end so clearly he's taken that aesthetic and kind of you know basically copied and pasted it at burberry so it's going to be very interesting to see what the actual clothes themselves look like once he does actually put them together but there's a lot of iconic you know uk um people here that he's kind of putting at the forefront um in terms of leading and spearheading this new campaign for burberry he's also introduced a new logo here that i'm seeing going forward that's going to be interesting obviously we've seen the trench here seen there i think another lady was wearing the um, what looked like a top with the flipping bra on it as well so there's a lot of that kind of imagery going forward and of course look who we got here we got skeppy man like skepta obviously front and center of the campaign himself and this is a pretty on the spot 
again, I'm not taking any credit for the prediction because I feel like this was pretty obvious that this was going to happen. And if you know anything about fashion, you know, you know, the, the most obvious and easy to connect a uh, dot people will do that in the, you know, in the quickest because, you know, you have to present three or four collections per year. Why waste time trying to think up crazy new innovative ideas where you can just go for the thing that's right to hand and kind of make that work. And especially if they've got a good relationship outside of fashion. Daniel Lee and Skepta, it makes complete sense, right? If they're really actually friends, they get along really well. It makes sense to continue that conversation going forward because you would imagine if you're Matteo Blasi at Protego Veneta, the last thing you want to do is continue having Skepta to be, or people like that to be your kind of figureheads because you want to try and rewrite or write your own chapter in the history of Protego Veneta. You don't want to just carry on what he's doing. Very rarely have I seen or heard of somebody taking up a house and continuing on with the ambassadors or with the influencers wherever they're working with that were working with a prior person it's usually you try and change it just so you can kind of you know tell a new and interesting story going forward so that was no surprise that this happened and he took him over to Burberry so it was just to see what happens there just looking from what I can see from the picture here of Skepta he's kind of standing in front of a red background with a black top on it looks like maybe a Sonova coat with a black shirt and this may look like at the bottom left here just underneath the logo of Burberry it looks like this may be like a rose or some sort of tulle thing that it's made to look like a flower so maybe this is what we're going to see in the show going forward but of course we're going to see it very soon okay that may be that rose here he's holding there maybe and maybe that's kind of clipped onto the front of it of the trench itself we've got a picture of Raheem Sterling also and then we've got another picture I think of um I think Shy Girl if I'm not mistaken here as well so clearly there is a change in what's going on. Clearly, we've seen already that they've um, already changed the logo um, of Burberry 2 going forward. Let's play what this video actually looks like. It's got the sound on it. In the rain, and still I bloom without a tab of doubt. We let it rain and let it pour. Secure the showers now. If they start doing all this like spoken word, you know, for the streets, rapping Bacar shit, I'm out. I'm out, please. I'm out. I'm out because I don't know what vision of London or UK people have, but I swear to God, the music is far more interested than this. Again, it's just a teaser. I know I'm kind of re overreacting, but if it's what we have to hear going forward, if they start fucking playing, I don't know, like reggae and shit or like dub or like ska music when he does his first show i'm going to be screaming from the hilltops because that's not fresh that's not new there's far more interesting sounds and people going forward now that you can kind of latch on to but who knows maybe it's a heritage thing and you're going to be tying it into this like if i see goldie down the runway like come on man like let's try, let's try and create some new legends goldie's done his thing he's done his bit especially for a brand like stussy that's something that i was kind of first you know exposed to when i kind of went to get into this thing so I, you know i've got a real attachment to him even more so when it comes to graffiti and whatever else and dj culture and everything else associated with that but still man let's create some new legends so if i see goldie and that on the runway or i don't know somebody else i'm gonna be absolutely off off my tits i swear to god but let's continue with this no. Oh yeah, I guess right. It wasn't overcoat. It's some sort of double-breasted number, right? You know, black guys always look good in that sort of shit. To be fair, give a black guy a good shirling coat. Give a black guy a good double-breasted overcoat. Money, like Zara sell those things by the bucket load every year. A good double-breasted coat, shirling coat. Black boys, Asian boys, we love that thing. We love it. Don't lie. You know, you had one. I know I had a couple in my collection. Okay, cool. Fair enough, yeah. There we go. We've got the new logo of it going forward. But let's quickly read the article and see what going what they're saying here. We'll obviously read that bit there. It says the campaign which has been captured by Tara Lebon, a photographer who's worked with Lee on several occasions, but Tega Veneta is described as Lee's first creative expression. I've seen him tap a cast of excitement. <laughs> what does honestly didn't he this guy is a little bit up his own ass, isn't it? Remember when he was at Patega Veneta, they did the whole thing of like removing their social media feed and no was it like an online magazine or something? But it was just basically Instagram. It was like, oh, we've got a, a different way. I don't know. Whatever, whatever, whatever sparks a creative spark, I guess it is what it is. But it continues. Um, it's described as Lee's first creative expression and has seen him tap a cast of exciting talent, including the likes of Skepta, Shy Girl, Liberty Ross. Oh, Liberty Ross, right? Okay, interesting. As well as Chelsea and football England star, sorry, Chelsea and England footballer, Raheem Sterling. Um, Lee's but, uh, Burberry has been described as a modern take on British luxury and a new chapter of the brand. What does that mean, a modern take on British luxury? Are we talking leather polo shirts? Like, wild one for this. Are we talking like satin joggers or some shit? 
if this turns into like a luxury version of palace i'm gonna be annoyed please don't do that please don't go like the tracksuit bottoms of loafers look like no one no one wears that that's from like that's like an archetype of an english person that doesn't exist or a british person doesn't exist even up north um, I, I don't see like what people would deem to be chavs wearing tracksuit bottoms with gucci loafers it's just not a thing anymore um if anything most people end up looking like flipping drill rap especially the kids you know across the flipping country they've all got that you know the white kids might have that flipping funny tiktok haircut with the you know with the mass of the front but they're all wearing the same flipping nike tech track suits and shit no one's wearing flipping you know um ghb bass loafers with you know flipping needles track pants it's not a thing please um and it continues uh Burberry is Monte Confession, the new chapter of the brand by its house itself, which also comes equipped with a new logo that's reworked take on a brand's equestrian night motif that was first used in the de- beginning of the twentieth century. So that's what it's called, an equestrian night. Huh. Okay. Equestrian night things, yeah. Let's equestrian night settings. Not too bad. The logo I'm not I I am actually I actually like, I'm not gonna lie. Um this on a t shirt and a hoodie is gonna probably sell like flipping hotcakes, especially if they do it in a cool and interesting way. I'm definitely sure that's gonna be done um well. Um it's worth noting that the color the clothing sorry featured in the campaign Baby Tetris product, although the campaign is a vision of all leads. Okay, cool. So none of this stuff featured on this campaign is actually what's gonna be showed. It's just heritage stuff, right? Stuff that's already in the catalog, like the trench already we've seen there. Um another trench, you know, standard overcoat, polo top, sorry. We've got featured on there. And we've got this kind of bra dress top kind of thing going on there too, that Liberty Ross is wearing. So clearly they're keeping everything that's gonna be shown under wraps and you know, whatever. One thing I just don't wanna see as a first collection of Daniel Lee at Burberry is is that whatever is too much of this brown cream whatever that tan color is because i feel like that was one of the things that kind of put me off when i first saw ricardo tissue's version of burberry it was just so much of this color was coming down the flipping runway it was hard to kind of really you know uh figure out what was new what was fresh and what was just the same old thing reworked with the same sort of color palette so maybe something fresher than this color palette going forward that would be a pretty good way to introduce it but to be fair it's a bit of a thankless job anyway no one's really done it well in recent years um it seems to be a doomed uh place but maybe daniel lee's going to be able to show and remind us just why he was such a in demand and well-loved person especially in the beginning you think of those first few collections of Bottega Veneta under daniel lee when he was really on it those were some of the best collections and some of the stuff is really tested a lot you know last tested lasted the test of time you think of that original lug boot the original original lug boot with the little lines in the front that obviously has been iterated many many times you think of some of the tops the coats the colorways you know even that kind of that kind of snotty green color that he kind of tapped into and made kind of you know a real kind of code going throughout the collections we just see what he kind of does with burberry and how he basically takes that going forward will there be a color will there be a shape will there be a you know will there be something that will stick kind of differentiate what he's doing between what everyone else has done because you know you look at some of the stuff that ricardo tishi did and he's supremely talented maybe one of the most talented of his generation and considering how iconic he was during his time at Givenchy, he goes to Burberry and he just turns out some of the most uninspired, drab, horrendous things I've ever seen in my entire life. Especially when you consider the amount of stick, you know, from fashion Twitter people, people like, you know, Matthew Williams, who I'm a big fan of gets from people, right? Matthew Williams gets so much, you know, criticism from people because of his designs. But then you look at what Ricardo Tishi was doing at Burberry and you think to yourself, there really is no difference. If anything, Matthew, Tish, Matthew Williams' stuff is better and he hasn't obviously got the level of experience that Ricardo Tishi has got in the industry anyway. So the fact that he's able to perform, able to play at that level with just, you know, uh, uh, the experience he's kind of picked up along the way doing his own thing says more about Matthew than it does about Ricardo. And um, yeah, I don't think Ricardo thing is a, I don't think you lose your talent overnight. I don't think so. Um, I just think maybe Beverage is such a such a um, overwhelming place to kind of get a grip on it's such a big 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 you know brand to kind of get under your control and make it work that maybe just people just don't kind of figure it out and there probably is enough time especially when you consider the amount of what's on what's on the line um the sales and whatnot going forward they just couldn't risk it so they had to kind of make some changes and obviously with someone like daniel lee waiting in the wings you know maybe the right was always on the wall for ricardo but let's see how happens going forward um let's see hopefully it is a far more interesting and fresh new approach to it let's hope
And then quickly moving on from that one, we got some also some other interesting news regarding Balenciaga. It's gone kind of quiet on Balenciaga's front, um, which has kind of been smart in terms of dealing with it in terms of a PI crisis type of way. They've sort of backed away from making any sort of public comments. They've essentially, I think, put a gag order on Demna and maybe, you know, kind of denied him the opportunity to try and clear his name because when he did try and clear it, he did essentially ob- obfuscate himself from any sort of blame. He did sort of push away any sort of responsibility and kind of made it seem like he was just this kind of, you know, this um, damsel in distress who was being pulled in different directions and he had no real control over what he was doing, which is obviously isn't, you know, laying in any kind of reality or facts because in some sense, fashion does this all the time they'll let you believe that some one person is responsible for the entire thing that's happening in front of your eyes when you know with discernment with a little bit of understanding a little bit of experience that there are loads of different people in the industry or loads of different people behind the scenes who are working at the same time with that person to create this amazing vision of what you see in the runway what you see in campaigns what you see in lookbooks what you see in editorials it's not always one person but fashion will let you believe it's one person and then that person will also kind of you know um kind of uh accept the lie and sort of perform behind it also but then once something goes wrong suddenly they start pointing fingers and start pushing away to people so to see blenz and demna and a few people associated with them kind of come out when that whole bdsm teddy bear thing happened and try and blame you know production companies who list essentially did what sometimes from my experience of working in the industry and knowing some people that have worked in the industry far longer than i've been exposed to it sometimes these production companies or these um you know people that do these things and put these things together these fixes they essentially all they do is just book ubers they book ubers they arrange the lunches um, they make sure everybody everybody on set has what they need but in terms of creating the vision that's on display that you see in editorials you see in campaigns that mostly comes from the brand and whoever they're working with in terms of creating, creating that creative whether it's collaboration with the photographer the stylist but there's always somebody in-house who's kind of what makes that work but a production company be responsible for the bdsm um bear kitty bear type of flip and shoot was a preposterous um assertion to put out there and the fact that they weren't willing to accept responsibility responsibility and trying to push it away and blame those people and then the whole you know fake suing thing happened and whatnot it was a real kind of own goal when it comes to caring and how they dealt with that in that kind of situation but it looks like they've kind of understood what they did wrong they've kind of put out you know they put out the statement they essentially deleted their instagram and made it basically um you know null by closing the comments and only leaving one post up so they basically refuse to accept any accountability but if you go on another page like diet prada and other and, and i think they also have like not style.com and stuff you see plenty of people standing off on what they think about balenciaga but i think in terms of pr strategy they did pretty well keep quiet and let it kind of die down and hope you can kind of rectify it going forward now the rumblings that i've been hearing on the grapevine was that they were never ever in any danger or them was never ever in any danger of being fired there was always this understanding behind the scenes that what he's done for the brand, how much money he's basically made them essentially, which kind of proves the point that, you know, cancer culture industry doesn't really exist. It only exists if you're not good and if you're not performing. But if you are performing, you can essentially get away with murder, right? We've seen it already with Daniel Lee. I think anybody else in his position, if he gets accused of calling a black person, whatever you call them in a meeting, even if it's not true, just the accusation alone, it could kill your career. But the fact that he was very good at what he did before he got booted from Balenciaga, sorry, Protect Veneta, and obviously he kind of helped the sales over there and kind of created a moment in culture, even sort of set, even just a moment in culture and, you know, was able to kind of spearhead some really interesting products and whatnot that kind of captured people's imagination. It was only... It was only kind of um, it only made sense for someone like a Demna, considering what he's done for the com- for the company overall and just fashion at large in terms of the shapes and the aesthetic going forward. It was very unlikely that Balenciaga were gonna you know bin him straight away. They were definitely gonna allow him to, you know, I would assume hang him hang himself by basically not performing. Maybe he kind of lets the situation get to him and we see the worst version of Demna going forward. Or because some people you know from what I've been gleaning online and reading between the lines. A lot of people, especially a lot of industry has a lot of people, a lot of people that are really big fans of Balenciaga Couture. A lot of people were saying that they were kind of getting tired of the constant kind of, um, of kind of constantly being the butt of the joke because that's essentially what Demna was doing, especially towards his time. You know, that legendary run at Vetema was definitely something that made me fall in love with the guy as a designer. But it definitely could be said that he was always trying to poke fun at the industry. 
Maybe it was come. Maybe it's something from bitterness from how he was treated. Maybe it's just him not really respecting people in the industry too tough. But the fashion industry people got tired of being the butt of the jokes all the time. They kind of got tired of being teased. They kind of got tired that it was always a bit of a troll going on, and they just wanted to see beautiful things on the runway again. And after a while, you know, them there's kind of one man mission to kind of make ugly beautiful again. People just want to look cute. So the kind of exaggerated shapes and the reliance on streetwear and sportswear, which you know people in fashion already hate because essentially it's a sort of like a dog for them hating i always felt like hating sports when streetwear was like a dog whistle to hate the working class or maybe just black people right because they just they hate that element they want to just be transported to a fairy um neverland kind of idea of fashion and be kind of you know you always see fashion people especially online when it comes to couture week they're waxing lyrical about a return to tailoring a return to fashion with a capital f they love all that magical side of things but when it comes to actually creating clothes that people in real life want to wear fashion people hate that and real life people you know you go to any major high street are wearing hoodies jeans sneakers t-shirts overcoats sports coats and stuff it's what them is kind of key and mastered but over time it felt like the, the the appeal of that was kind of waning so if anything the bdsm bear controversy happened at the right time because i felt like maybe De- balenciaga were always gonna maybe or caring always you know the group maybe all together maybe gonna sit sit flipping um what's his face they were gonna sit them down and basically try and work out a solution to kind of go back to what Balenciaga is kind of known for during the Cristobal era and kind of you know kind of center it on more on more fashion with a capital S and less of the street weary type of stuff luxury or kind of the elevated street wear. I'd imagine that would be the thing going forward so my guess when I made the video before was that they were obviously going to use this time to go back to what they know best or go back to what made Balenciaga Balenciaga and one of the kind of the key things that kind of pointed out was that post that they left up on their Instagram, which I think is still there, which has some archive footage of some couture shows from Blaine Chaga back in the day. And it was like a season's greeting sort of post they put up. And that was clearly for me an indication that they were thinking, OK, cool, going forward, we need to kind of um, we need to uh, give this guy them the like sensitivity training or whatever or archival training and get him back to really designing like more like this and less appealing to that edgy edgier sort of stuff because clearly the ramifications with that were really felt far and wide to the point where you know they had to kind of come out with statements and whatnot so this news regardless of high snobiety kind of touches on that and it says the following here it says uh, Balenciaga will show at Paris Fashion Week coming up. So Balenciaga will show at Paris Fashion Week in March, selling speculation that the brand would sit at one out expl- um, following an explosive ad campaign scandal. FashionInsiderStyle.com announced the news on January the 30th, posting the date and the time Balenciaga's full winter 2023 full uh, show would be, which is March the 5th at 11.30 a.m. Paris time on Instagram and other pages followed suit. Balenciaga itself has yet to confirm. So this is a conversation that we need going forward. That def- is definitely going to be debuting again on Paris Fashion Week, um, March, sorry, 5th of March, 11.30. So I do expect to see a much more pared down return to former glory Balenciaga. I expect to see that going forward for the foreseeable future. And this kind of edgy, edgelord, provocative, um, streetwear obsessed version of Balenciaga that Demna kind of carried on from Vetema is kind of gone. I think that's dead in the water. Um, that's definitely not going to be something going forward and I think maybe even behind the scenes they'll probably put something in place in terms of um, what you would call it in terms of procedures and protocols that will make sure that editorials like the one that features the BDCM Bear won't come out straight away and that essentially will kind of hamper them as creative vision because I read a lot of his interviews and I remember specifically during the time he was doing quite a lot of press he was kind of bragging and really boasting about the de facto freedom he gets from caring to do what the hell he wants like his vision is basically unfiltered because of how much grace he's been awarded because of the commercial success of Balenciaga so they kind of let him kind of do what he wanted but you would imagine off the back of this whole BDSM thing there's probably people now who are going to get in between him and his vision getting out there so even though we might see a more muted a much more pared down a much more subtle a less in your face Balenciaga it may not be really that cool and interesting because we might see suits getting their flipping mucky chubby um you know uh champagne and caviar drenched fingers into the pie 
and usually we all know what the common adage is about you know too many flipping fingers in the pie too many flipping shifts in the kitchen the final image or the final product we see on the runway could be somewhat crappy considering what we see before because before we saw pure visions like Hayley Semen um, at flipping um, Celine or before that at Saint Laurent what you're seeing for the most part on that runway is is Hedy being Hedy, right? He's putting out exactly what he wants to put out, his vision of there for better or worse. But the moment the suits start getting involved and they start demanding certain things, suddenly the brand starts to become a little bit shitty and then you suddenly stop buying it, you suddenly stop talking about it and you forget why. But let's see what happens going forward, but I'm not surprised by this news in the slightest. I am not surprised. What else we have to see here going forward? Oh, and then of course I was wondering. I was saying, um, I was talking earlier about the fact that I haven't really been out much, and I've kind of been, you know, keeping myself to myself and kind of trying to make sure that I'm where I need to be going forward in life in general and kind of getting some things in order. But I'm still kind of trying to go out at least a couple of times a month just to kind of experience whatever I can experience out there. And one thing that I'm definitely looking forward to is going to see Dixon at Coco is coming up this Friday. And the reason why I'm looking forward to it mostly is because if you're not aware, Coco, which is a legendary live music venue here in London, um, I think for the most part, I would say nightlife in London isn't that great, especially when it comes to clubs. I think one of the things that really sets us apart when it comes to clubs is the variety, I think. I think for the most part, on any given weekend, you could go and go to a nightclub legitimately, like a club or a bar uh, with somebody DJing, and you see someone playing metal, someone playing reggaeton, someone playing dub, someone playing jungle, bass music, house, techno, disco, whatever. There's always somewhere you can go listen to that thing all night long. Now, I don't think you can have that in any other city in the world, especially in not a place like Berlin, which I'm in love with. But for the most part, it's pretty one beat. It's pretty techno, and that's about it. And then whatever else is left will be tech and disco in the house for the most part. But most of it is techno, dark, industrial type of music. But I think in London, the variety is really good. But one thing that we really separate ourselves from when it comes to any city in the world is live music venues. We have some of the best live music venues. Like I think of off the top of my head, I think of that place called um, Paper Dress Vintage. It's this little spot in Hackney Central that is essentially a vintage secondhand basically store um most of it is kind of kitschy you know what what would you call it rockety type of beyond retro type of you know um vintage items varsity jackets think dresses think tartan or plaid shirts that boys like to wear when they fucking go to festivals denim shorts hats and whatnot that's the standard kind of vintage shop you'd expect to see in most metropolitan cities but it also doubles up as a venue so upstairs they have like a venue where they do you know dj nights or they have bands playing and it's usually a really good kind of range of music you can hear on any given day so imagine that's a quite good sick lineup then you've got the other place in flipping um lower clapton blondies that's mostly you know a lot of metal a lot of punk um sort of bands come and play there's a very small dive bar maybe a hundred capacity cap you know at the stretch maybe it's only 50 even to that, in that regard so all those places are really amazing another place is really cool is obviously coco and that's a, one of our better kind of live music venues, out obviously in Camden area, which is kind of synonymous with a lot of kind of history concerning the UK music over there. And I went to Dick's, no, so I went to Coco the last time I can remember viscerally was going to see Best Coast, right? A legendary um, shoegaze band. And they played there. And I remember how packed it was and how amazing the sound was and how amazing it was to see them perform in that kind of flipping auditorium and looking up and seeing everyone around. It just looked, felt amazing. So when they did announce that they were going through a major refurb, I think it was off the back of, if I'm not mistaken, they had like some sort of fire or something and they were going to invest money into kind of making it look spick and span. One of the new directions they were trying to go for is trying to have it to be a multi-use venue. So not only have it be you know, a live music venue thing, also have it be a place where you can host DJ nights. And if I'm not mistaken, again, I'm just going off the seat of my pants here. I think a most recent example was maybe the kind of music thing they had. I think that happened at Coco. But so far, I've been really um, resistant to kind of seeing anything online about it. I want to go and just experience it with my own eyes and kind of see what it's like when I'm there. And so far, from what I've been seeing on this Dixon All Night event that's happening on Friday, it looks like other people are feeling the same way because the attendance, again, you know, you can't take too much from it because it's kind of like, you know, people clicking and attending on Facebook events doesn't necessarily reflect on my people are going to be there. But still, for this Dixon All Nighter, you've got 1K people attending on RA. You've got the tickets completely sold out, absolutely sold out. And 
it were already like a couple of days, you know, a few days already before the flipping event's going to happen. And usually in London or most places, I'd imagine, when events like this happen and they're sold out towards this, you know, on the same week the event's on, you see loads of tickets pop up for resale because people, you know, maybe bought them on impulse, on a whim, and now they're kind of having second ideas, second thoughts about buying going, and then suddenly they all pop up again. But the demand has been aggressive to the point where there's been no tickets being available. And to me, it's really interesting to happen because, you know, Dixon obviously is somebody that I'm a big fan of and who I love, and loads of people that they love also, and it's clearly gone on to, you know, headier heights over the last few years. But I felt like in the last 18 months or so, Dixon has been in London or in the UK overall, enough times for most people to see him. So that's why I'm surprised that this event, which again, I know it's him all night, so that maybe kind of makes it different, but the fact that he's kind of um, demanding this level of, the, the fact that he's able to kind of drive this level of demand, even though he's been in the country many times in the last 18 months, just goes to show how popular he actually is now. Like, you know, because I think I missed out a couple of events in between him being here, maybe three or four, maybe three or four, but he's kind of it seems like month on month just gaining new fans and becoming even more kind of commercial in that sense but still remaining somewhat underground he's probably one my my main kind of commercially guilty vice dj person i listen to because a lot of people out there are into kind of someone like a bicep who's super i'd say commercial but still kind of has a little bit of that underground kind of core or is able to kind of pull from that sort of sound or has respect or people who kind of would regard themselves as underground or a sceny but I feel like Dixon, for me, is my one real guilty vice in that regard. But I don't feel guilty about it because I still think he's, you know, up there with one of the best DJs in the world. And I still think the thing that makes Dixon really amazing is that he can play to normie crowds, but he also can play to, like, scenesters. And I've seen it happening. You know, people like you would regard as chin strokers. I still remember that amazing night, the flipping um, Innovision label night at Fold a couple of years ago. And Dixon playing and seeing the smile on his face, you know, playing for like 500 people and it being a really small packed room, sweat dripping from the ceilings and him just having the whole flipping audience and he's flipping the palm of his hands was absolutely spectacular to see. So I'm really looking forward to seeing him playing at Flipping Coco's and I cannot wait. I swear on my ass, I cannot wait to see what happens and see how he kind of goes on. But I'm generally surprised that so far, there's been nothing popping up in terms of additional tickets. They're completely out, all completely gone. Um, and yeah, so, so Dixon, Friday 10th of February, 10 to 5 a.m. here in London town. I am really looking forward to seeing it happen. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing it happen. Of course, if you ain't got tickets, I feel sorry for you. The one thing I would say, if you ever got tickets, please do not buy them from Flippin's, you know, resellers who are not on official platforms, especially places like Facebook and Instagram. The risk is just too high. I know ticket swap is a bit, you know, hit and miss but you're better off sticking with tickets ticket swap than other platforms because people love to scam and to trick people out of their money in those type of situations especially when you're desperate and you really want to go somewhere people will use that desperation and kind of try and get the better of you so don't do it if you can avoid it don't do it if you can avoid it then if we go to touch upon this couple of shows i've been watching online that i thought i would kind of you know address kind of put out there and see if some of you guys are feeling the same way so the other day i was checking out this show called the arc Mostly because I'm a big sci-fi and fantasy nerd and geek and love to see those shows in general, TV series in general. You know, I'm always flipping online, checking out new updates regarding, you know, SpaceX and space travel overall. It's just something that kind of, you know, it's a little bit of a thing that I kind of I'm, I'm into overall. And I thought, hey, why not check out the series called The Ark? And considering what I went through with the rig on Amazon and how I felt like I was robbed of my time, and it legitimately went nowhere after the first season and i'm not going to watch it ever again in my life and i re really despise the creators of that show for creating something that had a all, all right premise and then essentially kind of running into the ground and not even telling anything interesting towards the end of it i had to make an executive decision even though only one episode is out to just bow out gracefully of this series so it's on sci-fi at the moment and it's called the arc and the general premise of as you can tell by the name is that um, a population of people from Earth leave to go to another planet, maybe because Earth is, you know, something happened to it, who knows. And on their way to going to this new planet, they're all in deep sleep. And essentially they go, I think they go through, I think it's a meteor storm or something happens, an accident, and one half of the ship completely disintegrates and kind of, you know, d d gets destroyed in a crash. And then all the kids in the pods, they essentially wake up, the young people. And then they realise quite quickly that all the, 
seniors or the elders are dead and they have to kind of you know take charge and delegate and kind of you know seek new pastors new without the leadership of the people who were meant to be in leadership being the older folks in there and from what i've seen in the first episode it's not an interesting story because it kind of quickly but surely devolves into or dive you know devolves into a flipping um teen you know drama based on relationships and whatever else it may be in space so basically turns into gossip girl and whatever else in space and i've got no time for that in the slightest and and the thing about that for me was really irritating is that there's probably a real good story at the base of this that you could tell you know the idea of you know maybe i am getting a bit tired of the whole dystopian you know the world is dying we have to kind of seek pastures new and seek another habit of you know habit habit of planets out there blah 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 but there is an interesting story to tell about you know personal account personal accountability personal responsibility about leadership about struggle about hard work about you know um meeting cooperation whatever there's something went to die with young people like an interesting story to tell but when you just frame it under the guise of like a teen romance angst drama in space i've completely tapped out and that's what i saw from the first episode so in an effort to guard my frustration so i don't get pissed off and frustrated and start shouting and shit i just quit after one episode because i I just know it's not going to get any better and i know more likely than not this show is definitely going to get cancelled if this show gets picked up for a season two it's it's going to be incredible again i'm not you know i'm not besmirching people working on the show and all the actors and stuff because i'm sure this is a big deal for them going forward but i think even the people working on it they probably know that the show is absolutely cack there's no way that people that are working on this show don't know that this show is doo-doo and it's dead on arrival because I watched one episode and I can already tell this is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to do anything interesting. It's just going to be Gossip Girl in space without any of the fun stories that you originally saw in the original, ep- you know, not, not even Gossip Girl, the reboot of Gossip Girl. That's what it's going to be because Gossip Girl, I think the OG version was pretty decent. Um, You know, even Emily in Paris, stuff like that is, is an all right, you know, show. It's not something I'm going to waste my time watching on a daily, but I can't say people like it. But this, the arc on sci-fi, it already looks terrible and I've only watched one episode. So I had to kind of bow out gracefully because I didn't want this to turn out to the same issue that I had with the flipping the rig. And another thing to touch, touch upon, that obviously everyone's spoken about, but I just wanted to touch upon it here, is regarding The Last of Us Episode 3. Episode 4 is already out. I've already watched it. It kind of feels like a bit of a filler. It was only 40 minutes and it kind of leads into another story that they're going to tell in Episode 5. It's going to be far more interesting. But Episode 3 was the episode that broke me. Because for the most part, I've been staying away from spoilers. I've been staying away from explainers regarding the Last of Us game. I didn't want to know anything about it. I went to go into it blind. But how well done episode three was and how compelling the story and how invested I was in the Last of Us universe, it made me go and watch a two hour plus long explanation of the game and all its different plots and storylines and stuff to get an understanding of where the show is going to go. From what I understand, the people making the show aren't exactly going by the book when it comes to the game many things have been changed already about the show going forward i think even just the the main girl i forgot her name um the little girl that basically's got immunity to whatever this virus is that's going on there in the last of us she isn't you know for lack of a better term she isn't as cute looking as the girl in the game is and from what i understand the girl in the game is far more endearing and you like her way more than the character in the tv series Terry series character i think she's in the game of thrones she comes she comes across way more likable in the game of thrones than she does in this tv series in this tv series she's very very annoying and her lack of understanding and willingness to cooperate and whatever else is and just drives me up the wall you know pedro pascal's character every day i saw every series of every episode sorry so far it feels like there's one episode there's one instance where he says hey don't move stay there and the moment he turns around she moves and goes somewhere else it's just annoying it's a constant flipping you know that sort of stuff kind of bugs me all the time that sort of stuff anyway episode three i think was done really well of course at the center of it was this amazing gay romance that was told really well without being cliche and without being cringy without being corny and i think this really is a clear indication clear indication that for all of the posturing and the representation and the woke nonsense going on down there especially with liberal types when it comes to tv series at the heart of it what the main issue i feel like with a lot of people was that this kind of this kind of um that kind of shift in culture or in art where things generally tended to kind of shift across and everyone was trying to make sure everybody felt represented on tv 
or in movies or in anything or so any arts going forward it, that overcorrection was way too much and i felt like people at their core what they were really wanted to say was that if you're going to overcorrect like this just make sure the work is good but unfortunately when you overcorrect to that extent and it feels like a little bit like you know cultural affirmative action where you're trying to make sure you're appeasing all these different groups at all the same time you're definitely going to be caught in a, in a in a loop where you're kind of just putting out stuff because you're putting it out and because you can't say no to this specific specific demographic of people and i feel like this will happen a lot during the kind of you know awful times of hollywood and i feel like things are kind of starting to change a little bit now in the entertainment industry trying to change people are starting to kind of wake up to the fact that you know as annoying as these kind of tropes are they're necessary but also at the heart of it if you tell a good story no one cares it doesn't care if you if you put a non you know uh non-binary people queer people gay people on, on the screen no one actually cares if the story is compelling enough you know you can tell whatever story you need to tell and i feel like this is a clear example of it because from what i've been seeing online across the board everybody's raving about how amazing episode three of the last of us was in season one everyone is raving about it. they're saying how amazing it was how genuine it was even gay people who are generally quite critical of gay media that gets produced in hollywood or the entertainment industry and really kind of look at it with a discerning eye even they were able to tell hey i can identify with the story i've heard stories of or like this you know it's something people can kind of identify with on, on, on every facet and i felt it was done expertly well and why i felt it was done really well is that in the actual game i felt like this story even you know was it in some parts more tragic than how the story was told in the game because it's completely different from what i saw reading and watching things online so the edits they made to the source material was better than the actual source material in some way shape or form which you don't never ever see i think for the most part people like myself who are balls deep in comics and anime and other bits and bobs of stuff that kind of gets adapted to the big screen one of the big annoyances for someone like me is that they clearly you kind of push away the source material you already saw what happened with the rings of power right with that great work um lord of the rings from flipping tolkien that for the most part the people that are producing rings of power of course they couldn't really adapt the source material too tough because it was just a prologue whatever it would be called but they kind of pushed away any idea of honoring tolkien's legacy and they just wanted to write a news to legacy but the legacy was horrible it was just kind of centered in representation and nonsense like that and work ideologies and wasn't necessarily telling any interesting stories which of course reflected in this popularity it kind of sunk before it kind of went anywhere and for the most part i didn't really see it being mentioned in any awards or nominations and stuff people kind of just pretended that show didn't exist even though when it did launch the whole kerfuffle around rings of power was that it was going to be competing head to head with the house of house of the dragon but eventually you know after watching a couple episodes of house of the dragon even though it had a considerably less budget than rings of power you can immediately tell there's a far better story at the heart of the house of the dragon because guess what they honored and they kind of adapted the source material for what it was as opposed to just pushing it away so again last of us was flipping amazing i really loved it um i dug deep in all the flipping lore around it behind the scenes and i really did enjoy seeing everything kind of laid out the way it was i really really did enjoy it so i wanted to quickly touch upon this because i thought this is interesting and i think this probably needs to be spoken about because i've seen a lot of people kind of mention it online and i didn't want to let it go by without kind of chucking out my little two pence so i think some of you may be aware especially if you're in the scene and whatnot and you care about techno and you care about club culture and whatnot if you don't then i guess skip ahead of all this stuff but can only get a little bit in the weeds with the stuff it's a bit in, inside baseball talk but for the last what couple of days or week or whatnot this interview um featuring a guy called nicholas rose on the platform playful magazine which i follow on instagram which i definitely think is one of the premier type of um platforms and publications that are focusing on highlighting people within club culture within techno within whatever else it may be an extended universe when it comes to kink and whatnot blah 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 and they do a really good job of kind of filling the gap that ra kind of used to kind of fill with their ra exchanges because i think ra exchanges are basically turned into another arm of press and promo but at its core when it first or when i first kind of got into listening to ra exchanges especially when i was kind of you know in the depths of canning town minding my business living in ends and kind of living far away from the scene but ra exchanges were a really cool way to kind of transport myself into that world 
of techno, of club culture, of electronic music, of dance music in general, and kind of hear from the voices that kind of were spearheading things and doing interesting, cool things. And even the journalists that they kind of got to kind of, you know, interview these people were really inquisitive, really clued up, knew what they were talking about. So you got a real understanding of what was going on. And of course, back then on RA, the comments are open. So you would hear somebody talking about a certain issue and you go into the comments and you hear somebody else who's got, you know, another perspective or another set of experiences kind of, you know, contradicting or adding to whatever. So it was a really cool little dialogue. You kind of got an understanding of what the scene was about. And I felt like I was able to kind of gain a real understanding of what was going on without being anywhere near it. And this was back when I used to live at home in Canyon Town. So I was in the depths of, you know, of my flipping of that life every day and ends um, away from everything, not close to clubs, not fold didn't exist back then, even though it was around the corner from where I used to live and I was able to be transported into it. So it was really important in terms of educating me and kind of giving me an understanding and appreciation for the scene so that when I did come into it, I kind of understood and was aware of certain things before kind of seeing them for the first time. So, but obviously, like I said, prior RA exchanges now has just turned into another sort of you know promotional tour people do before they're putting out an ep on the album or something it's not really anything interesting for the most part you know so i kind of put it to buy but playful magazine has definitely filled that gap so i definitely recommend you check them out they've got a really cool instagram they do a really cool online magazine which i think comes physically as well you can buy on their site so big up them for always putting together really good interviews and i always try to make sure that i kind of check out most of them and one of them that kind of went semi-viral on my side of the social media was this interview um which is titled having a ghb addiction and how the drug can affect the techno scene um which is an interview with this guy called nicholas sorry with this person i think was it this person how do you say it with the pronouns with with someone called nicholas rose so this interview is really interesting because if if i'm not mistaken nicholas rose was the person who during the peak of the pandemic was at the center of a pretty serious controversy regarding rso at that time i think it was called like river riviere sudust and you know formerly grease Mueller. and he essentially had a little bit of a kerfuffle at the club where he was told to put on a mask i think as the story goes he was told to put on a mask and when he was in the middle of smoking or ordering a drink that little interaction with a security guard or a bouncer went left and then he got chucked out and then, you know, the kind of reaction from him the next day or the following day was to go to Instagram and basically accuse um, that club at the time of discrimination and say they were racist and saying they were homophobic and blah, 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 which essentially led to River Sudus at the time closing down, if I'm not mistaken. Again, this is during the peak of the pandemic. So everyone's suffering. Um, no one's able to go out. No one's able to play everyone's going stir crazy locked into their house and then i think there was a little gap of opportunity where people were allowed to put on these kind of outdoor raves which essentially were just you know people you know djing you know under a roof but there was no kind of walls kind of thing and people kind of getting around that sort of loophole that way and people understand them more understanding of the situation that was going on and trying to kind of you know acquiesced but to do that in the midst of that kind of drove the club with all the outrage online it kind of forced them to close down which essentially led to loads of bookings being cancelled. So you can only imagine how people felt who were going to play there, people that were going to go there playing trips, myself included. I was planning to go there all that time and that kind of shut things down. And then in the end, I think people got fired, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> off the back of it. And I think he even maybe got a job, if I'm not mistaken. Did he get a job? Something happened anyway. He got some sort of like, um, or sorry, they got some sort of um, advisory role or something. I forgot what it was. Don't, don't hold me to it. But I do remember the actual video. I've actually got it here the original video this is a uh, on the instagram account called rave don't stop and i think this is the original video of it where he kind of where they sorry where they kind of came out and said um about their issue regarding um their experience at river Suda. so as the caption goes here berlin club river Suda accused racism and homophobia of course this is the same person um it looks like they have grown some hair and decided to put some braids in looking good there but let's play the original video of them complaining about their treatment whilst they were at um, what you call it, River Sudist. Everybody, so today I'm going to talk about my experience at the new Gleese Mula at the Sinoid party uh, a few days ago. It was. Oh, yeah, quickly just stop it again because I always do this when I'm playing videos. I just I, I didn't remember at the time, but this is during Sinoid as well. So, Sinoid, if you're not mis if I'm not mistaken, again, I'm not in Berlin, I don't live there, I just visit there, you know, periodically here and there during the year. But if I'm not mistaken, 
it's usually one of the parties that's always oversubscribed anyway. It's usually always, you know, super busy. They sell out tickets. It's super in demand. And it effectively attracts the hardcore, you know, side to side, big boot stepper type of people who kind of, you know, legitimately think being into techno and going to raves is a personality trait. And maybe the worst of the worst. So you can understand maybe, you know, temperatures being a little bit raised because of that kind of crowd, right? Because if you're a club, you're going to like having them there because they bring people and people bring money and they spend money at the bar. But then if you work there, it might be a bit of a hassle because they're just a bit annoying in it and it kind of rub you up the wrong way. So many people were on edge to begin with because of the rave itself to begin with. But anyway, we continue. It was disgusting what I dealt with. And I think that it is very important that as many people as possible hear what I went through and experienced because based on my identity and just who I am, I've experienced a lot of things that the average cis white person probably wouldn't even have nightmares about experiencing. I'm special. I wrote out a little bit of some notes to just keep things in proper chronological order. I'm gonna keep it pretty cut and dry so you get the facts and it's up to you to decide how you feel about it. So. Between the hours of 3.15 and 4.15 a.m. on August 15th, going into the next day, I attended Sinoid at Glismila. It was fun the first several hours, and around the hour of 4 a.m. it became very fucked up. As they were very strict about masks, and that's understandable, the way in which they treated me was nasty and unexplainable. As I stood in line for the bathroom to obtain water after dancing several hours, I was approached by one of the crew, and I told I was not wearing my mask properly. As he said that I responded and I haven't even taken off my mask at all. He replies that it needs to be a little bit more up. And I explained to him that my nostrils weren't even showing in the slightest. It's pretty much like this. The mask entailed, uh, it went a little bit further down my nose, uh, simply to the point of my nostrils. At that moment, a little bit confused, I replied, okay, I don't see what the issue is, but uh, please explain because it's still in my face. To which replied, if you wish to drink anything, you have to be sitting down. And my response was, I have been dancing for three hours straight, and I asked if it would be okay if I sat down in this particular spot on the ground and uh, have some water there. He says, okay. So I go ahead and I sit down on the ground to take my water, and I think at this moment he may have taken it as a joke. So I stand up to finish my drink of water before I walk off, and at that moment he opens up a conversation with my friends in German, completely excluding me, which does also tend to happen out here. <laughs> how dare somebody in berlin <laughs> speak in german in front of me all right don't they know who i am right how dare you <laughs> honestly nicholas man well go on man you need to relax man this is too much too much i say to them can you translate this conversation to me because i don't know what's going on right now he ignores me and walks away i uh, i talk to my friends and they say you know they don't <laughs> <laughs> if there's one thing we know about nicholas again i don't know this guy from a lick of paint never interacted or met him in real life at all and all i have to judge is these couple of clips right this clip and obviously the one we're going to talk about later in the interview but from what i've been able to ascertain nicholas wants to be seen at all points nicholas must be seen they must be seen if you don't see nicholas nicholas will make you aware that he, you you have not seen nicholas and nicholas must be seen that's the one thing. So the fact that the bouncer just walked away <laughs> must have been so crushing. I think he's very happy that you uh, sat down and drank your water. So just be patient for a second. Uh, all of a sudden, he brings this very big, heavy, cis German white dude over to me and asks me. How do you know he was cis? How do you know that? Please, how do you know he was? Judging, judging. If I can speak German or English. I said, I don't speak German. I only speak English and I would appreciate it if you can continue to speak English for the duration of this conversation. <laughs> Honestly, the ego and the demands on these people, man. I don't understand this. Legit, man. Raving isn't that deep. And even if it is that deep, the one thing that you don't do is try to start an argument or get into some sort of you know, verbal altercation back and forth with a bouncer. I think I said that in my original clip before. It never ends well. It really never ends well. Never in the history of raving, in my extensive years, right, going on to maybe two decades worth of raving, have I ever won an argument with a bouncer? I've never once had an argument with a bouncer, 
where they've told me to do something and I said no or some or whatever, some sort of you know back and forth like that, where they've said, you know what, you're right, mate. Don't worry, have a good time. Here's here's a couple of tokens on me. Actually, I'll have a drink. That's never happened. Even if they're wrong, you still get chucked out. Even if they're wrong, you still get chucked out. You still get your marching orders. And if you don't get your marching orders, you get physically thrown out, like flipping Jazzy Jeff in the in the flipping Fresh Prince of Bel Air. That's what happens. So demanding that you get addressed in one way and all this sort of stuff is legitimately insane in my opinion especially if you want to remain at the party if you don't care about remaining fair enough you know kamikaze the thing but if you care about being there maybe lowering your tone maybe you know not being maybe so confrontational maybe trying to avoid getting into some sort of back and forth and maybe trying to meet the person where they're at that may go a long way to kind of get you back into their good graces maybe who knows but again what am i what do i know because your other colleague is excluding me purposely from a conversation that i know is directly about me refusing to speak english and then also knowing fluently how to speak english is crazy to me <laughs> he says to me listen i don't care i'm going now, what's crazy to me is you demanding that people in Berlin speak to you in English because you can only speak English. That's legitimately insane. I'm going to ask you a simple question again. Do you speak English or German? <laughs> so, I respond in this. Nicholas is a legend. Saying, uh, listen, dude, do you not hear me? Are you not listening to what I just said? He said, yeah, I heard you. Uh, but answer the question. And I said, well, I speak English. Wow. He says, well, you're wearing your mask inappropriately, and we have noticed that this is an issue. You need to wear your mask properly, or there will be consequences. I said... I legitimately forgot, because this has been a long time, this is 2021, I forgot how badly they came across in this, man. Looking back, I literally forgot, which makes sense why in this new interview, you know, again, I'll just finish this bit, and then we'll talk about it anyway, but yeah. Listen, dude, my mask was not fully off my face. I don't understand why you are getting up on me when there are actually 10 cis white people standing right around me, all white men, talking freely and dancing or shifting. <laughs> he says, we aren't talking about them, we're talking about you. And I responded, my mask is not even being worn properly to you, uh, but to me it is. And I'm sweating a lot from dancing and so it is expanding and moving a lot but it's still not below my nostrils. And he says, well, I don't know how to help you. I asked if it's possible, can you give me an extra mask if you have one? Because if the team has one, I'll be glad to wear it. So I can comply and make sure that that situation is de-escalated. So while I'm standing in my thong, he aggressively walks me to the entrance of the club. I then ask if he's helping me to get a mask and he refuses to respond. <laughs> classic, classic bouncer trick. And this has happened to me a couple of times in London, illegitimately. I'm going to say this with just... Um, a level of certainty that I don't usually apply to things that I say but in 99.9% .9 of the times that I've ever been chucked out of a club and it happens it happens many it happens for various reasons don't need to always be fights or anything un, unbecoming it can just be you just being annoying because you're just too drunk and too lit and too high or whatever not and just get on people's nerves without realizing that's one thing that drugs and alcohol does it kind of numbs your inhibitions it also numbs your uh, it kind of numbs your cringe receptors and how you are uh, responding and adapting and flowing people around you, you don't really understand it so in your head it's kind of like it reminds me a little bit of like um the guy in between us in your head you think you're the you think it's jay right you think you're the flipping lady killer you think you're getting all the nosh you think all the girls are flipping they will have to carry mops around with them every time they see you somewhere because you're going to get them all wet and stuff that's what you think in your head but in actuality you're annoying everybody you're jumping into people's conversations you're asking them the same questions 17 times you're touching them you're whatever like you're just you're invading their personal space all these things are happening without you realizing it so usually in those in those events or in those occasions people that are not as high or drunk as you can see that and there's no need to get in a conversation they just tell you to leave like hey you probably had enough it's probably time for you to go home and in some cases they'll even give you a bottle of water on the way out hey here a bottle of water you know take it easy be chill and then sometimes if you forget and you, you know, you, you're just too high and you come back the next time, they'll be like, hey, don't you remember what happened to you last time? Next time, just chill out, relax. It's kind of like a, you know, a normal conversation because they know most likely, you know, it happens to most people that go out enough times. You're definitely going to have some occasions where you just get a little bit too crazy. So in those, like I said, in my history of going out, I think 99% of the times I've been chucked out, it's always been warranted. 
every single time it's been warranted. There's never an occasion where it's never been warranted. And most of the times when it does happen, it happens like that, where the person or the bouncer, whoever it is, the security guard will say, hey, come with me, let me talk to you. <laughs> it's such a good one. And let me talk to you, it'll be over here, over here, over here. And then quickly, when short, quickly, right, you're realizing you're outside of the club. And the person may talk to you. They may actually have a conversation with you. And at the end, they say, hey, by the way, this is the end of your night. You're not going to get back in anymore. And then if you need to get a coat, your coat back, you give them your, your, your flipping token, they'll get it for you and stuff, whatnot. But that's essentially the end of your night. But sometimes you just say, hey, just go home. Just leave, relax. You're, you're too lit. Just leave, go away. And usually in that moment, if you're not too over the edge, well, as soon as that person says that to you, it kind of snaps you out of your little delusion and your little kind of, you know, reality. And you start to realize, oh, cool. That is true, actually. I am actually a bit too messed up. You get a bit embarrassed, so you just kind of sulk away, right? You kind of sliver away and kind of go back home. But obviously for this person, not so much. To respond, keep uh, constantly still uh, pointing towards the door. And then, I, and then I ask him one more time and he says, you're out. <laughs> so keep in mind for about, uh, keep in mind I have no belongings. Five to six minutes, I go back and forth with him and his colleagues as to why it's important for me to have a belongings when they're kicking me out. And he says, well, okay, you can go get your bag since it's checked. And I reply that uh, it's not just my bag, but my other small pack, which has the rest of my important belongings in it, such as my phone, keys, wallet, and uh, residence ID card. They respond with, uh, why would you bring your identification to a club like this? And I said, well, since you're from Germany, you probably don't face the same consequences I do as an American citizen. But I must have my identification on my person at all times. In the worst case, <laughs> something does happen, you know? Anyway, you get the idea. Nicholas was left outside um, in the clothes that they were wearing when they went to the rave. I think it was some sort of bikini, some sort of very light, not very adapt, you know, not very appropriate for the outdoor weather. So clearly it was a bit of an affront in that way. So, you know, it could have been dealt with in a better way. But at the time, I think I initially said that clearly this was an issue, maybe a personal issue that Nicholas went through with the bounce or security guard. I don't think this was indicative of the whole establishment, but because Nicholas came out so aggressive, so forthright in that the whole institution, the whole club itself was, you know, discriminating against him because of his... Um, because he was homo because he was homosexual, because he's black, it essentially um led to the club having to kind of pause all future bookings and essentially go on a little bit of a enforced sabbatical to kind of get things sorted out in the background. And in the process people got fired. They hired a new security team who were more maybe culturally aware, sensitivity training, all this sort of nonsense. Just because one person had a bad altercation with a bouncer who was maybe a little bit jobs worthy a little bit high on their flipping authority and whatnot but that essentially in my opinion wasn't the right way to go about things because i think i said at the time if that was me and i felt like it was a personal issue that i went through because this sounds like it you know you get into a bit of a back and forth with a bouncer you just kind of you know you dm the club themselves you contact them after hours you maybe visit them during the week i don't know how it works out there in berlin but you could get in contact with them directly to kind of raise your grievances and if you don't get the response that you you know like or that doesn't kind of make you feel good then maybe you can go on the tear and start destroying them online but i thought to go straight online and say what you're saying knowing the power of social media especially in that moment post george floyd i don't know it just felt a little bit irresponsible again you felt you know that's not my it's not my place to say how people should react to their slights because i'm sure if i was in that experience and i felt slighted i may have responded a different way but i feel like from the experience that i've had in the past and why i understand berlin club culture to be like to accuse a club in berlin to be racist homophobic is a bit of a stretch and if you do accuse them of something like that you have to come with more than just your anecdotal i was told to wear a mask i didn't want to wear one not speaking german not speaking english sort of story you have to come with something more than that i would assume anyway it continues so they decided to go and play for magazine and now it's a different pivot it feels like so it went from being an advocate for inclusion and representation in the club to suddenly now becoming an advocate for ghb awareness and if you're not aware ghb for whatever reason has took a it's taken a really crazy grip on the scene out there in berlin from what i've been led to believe from the time that i've been going out there for a few years now I've kind of seen it increase in popularity. I think I was kind of exposed to it for the first time, actually, in the Bergheim Toilets, which is really funny. But essentially, I was um, in there on my own, 
And as you do, when you go to Burger, and you always meet cool, interesting people in there, I ended up befriending a group of gay guys, and then we ended up just hanging out, dancing, chilling out, whatever, doing, doing what we need to do. And then we went into the toilets to, you know, do our adult business. And when we were still in there, I didn't even know, what, I'd never seen what GSB was, never heard of it in my life. And then when we were in there, they were all kind of pouring out these little liquids into flipping water caps, right? And I was like, oh, what's this? And then they told me what it was and they were all getting lit. And I like, do you want some? I was like, oh, no, I'm good. Because I I think when I was speaking to one of the persons inside the flipping the toilet, they were like, oh, you can't really drink on it. You kind of have to make sure you only take a certain amount and be really strict about it because it can get a little bit crazy after a while. And then that's the first time I've ever seen it in my life. And then over the subsequent years, I've seen more and more people be taking it, like openly these times. Because before it was like a little bit of a secret -y kind of thing. Only those in the know would know. And now it kind of feels like it's way more popular, especially within the gay community of people who kind of tend to, I guess, take it because it maybe relaxes you. It maybe it's euphoric. Who knows what the reason is? But for some reason, gay people specifically have kind of really latched onto it. So it's become a real big problem for some people in the dance music scene because, you know, it's become a drug that people have been taking as a choice to kind of go out that and maybe ketamine and whatnot. But ketamine maybe it's kind of gone in popularity. But there's definitely an issue around it. And when you kind of couple that with what's been going on with the spiking instances in some clubs in Berlin and the kind of over-reliance on GHB and addiction levels and stuff and how it's been slowly destroying people, it's clearly an issue. But I just feel like in this instance talking about ghb addiction and trying to raise awareness to, for it and whatnot i just feel like interviewing or having nicholas rose to be the spearhead for it just isn't the right way to go about it especially when you consider from what I, from what, again i listened to this entire interview i think the only thing i missed out was maybe the last 10 minutes <clears throat> but from what i've been able to glean i understand um, Nicholas has only been clean off of GHB since December or something. So it's been less than a, less than two months since they've been clean off of GHB. So to have somebody that hasn't even been a year sober or a year abstaining from GHB now suddenly talking about the ills and the wrongs of it is really, <laughs> it doesn't really make much sense, especially when you kind of frame it with what happened with the last um, sort of interaction we've seen of Nicholas, which is obviously regarding the issue with River Sudus. Because from what we've been able to ascertain, this was around the time when GHB was really taking a grip on Nicholas's life at that time. But in this interview, from what, I'd, as from what I've, again, listened, I've listened all the way up to an hour, I've heard no acceptance or understanding or acknowledgement of what ghb did to nicholas at that time that could have affected how nicholas viewed the experience that they went through in the club with the bouncer so that lack of um personal responsibility kind of rubbed you up the wrong way and in general just just me kind of speaking from my side of things i just didn't feel like he came across as the most um what you call it he didn't come across as the most believable person in the world it kind of just felt like this is a bit of a grift in the one way shape or form um, there was a lot of me, me, me talk. There was a lot of rambling. The interview didn't really get many questions in. He was really kind of, he went on there with a plan or they went on there, sorry, with a plan to kind of get their kind of point across of what they wanted to speak about without very little kind of, I felt like personal inventory. Because if you're going to talk about these things, you have to really talk about the ugly side of things and own up to your own faults. And I felt like there wasn't much of it in this case. And for someone like myself, who's kind of dabbled on both ends of it, I've kind of went at clubbing with the idea of getting effed up for the most part because I wanted to kind of escape my reality. So you just kind of, you know, douche, you know, kind of run full pelt at the drugs and the drinking and places like clubs and dance music or electronic music in general is a great way to escape from your reality, especially if you're doing it on the kind of weekly basis you can kind of get wrapped up in that world and think that's all that really matters and you know it can kind of really kind of alleviate all the kind of pains you're going through but one acknowledge not one thing i think most people would acknowledge who kind of go out a lot is that drugs and drinking does really sometimes especially if you do it a lot it can negatively affect you in terms of your personality and how you react and act to things i know for me it can definitely negatively affect me and kind of bring out the worst of me and i think in general there's maybe a part of us especially when you drink and you do drugs where it kind of it just kind of um, magnifies who you actually are and it kind of rids you of any inhibitions. So you just kind of, you don't have any filter. But I feel like much like, um, what movie is it? I think it's a movie, I think it's Interstellar. I think it's Interstellar where I think the robot, the personal robot that he had that kind of walks like that, right? Like a Tetris block. Um, there's a scene in it where 
um, what's his face? Oh, I forgot the main guy's face, but there's a scene in it where he basically says, oh, what's your honesty rating barometer? Because I think this this robot basically speaks as a personality, whatever. And he says, oh, it's at 90% because humans can't handle 100% honesty because we're emotional beings. And I feel like in general, in life, you can't go around being 100% honest with people because, you know, it can maybe get you in trouble. And I feel like drugs and alcohol can sometimes get you to a point where you want to be your true self but it can be too much for some people and you can maybe sometimes say things that you probably shouldn't say and it can obviously if you do it enough it can definitely ruin your life and ruin relationships because people just don't want to have that energy around them and i feel like in this entire interview nicholas didn't touch on that side of things he didn't really get into the weeds into the real dark side of things where it can really go left because if he did do that Oh, so if they did do that, that would be that would have they would have to acknowledge all the ills and all the wrongdoings that they've done throughout their existence or throughout their time over there in Berlin, and clearly they're still not maybe comfortable or willing to accept what they've done in order for you know the situation they've kind of been in overall. And at the heart of it, also something I've always thought I felt like came from this, where it kind of it really kind of was to me radiated for this interview. It just felt like I was listening to somebody who essentially got lost in the source and is generally just lost in terms of a career, in terms of a purpose. Because I've always said in general that as much as I love club culture and I love dance, I love dance music, I love electronic music, I love DJ culture, everything about it. And I feel like it came for me at the right point in my life where I was going through some stuff at home and I went to just escape and I went to go somewhere where I can just kind of forget about my troubles and whatnot and I got absorbed into it from club promoting from designing flyers from booking DJs to DJing myself to making music or trying to make it the going and doing techno tourism all those things were so impactful in my life especially the people I met along the way it was incredible but you can get lost in the source it happens to the best of us it does happen when you go out enough times you can start to kind of get just you know uh overwhelmed with everything with the drugs with the alcohol with the dopamine of just meeting new people it can just be a bit crazy especially when you add all the sexual elements to it it can just get really really nuts and you can you have to sometimes temper it and pull yourself back here and there and over the years i've seen some people have decided to maybe just completely abstain and just say you know what enough that was a chapter of my life is over with it's closed some people go the sub the sobriety route where they're like you know what i love this music a lot but i need to know that i can enjoy it without the drugs and then they do it and if they enjoy the clubbing without the drugs they just continue going completely sober or some people like myself you take like into you know you take like um you take like uh breaks in between here and there you decide to like not go out for a few months and you go out for a bit and you don't go out but you're always kind of aware in the back of your head that you can't go too far because if you go too far you get lost in the source and there's no coming back but then outside of that you also know that it's very important to live a somewhat fulfilling and fruitful life outside of clubs, outside of nightlife, that can give you some sort of purpose and can ground you. And then you can use the clubs as a kind of way to essentially release and have a good time at the end of the week, which is what it should be served as. I'm not really a big, from in my opinion, I don't really think, you know, you should be raving into Mondays every single week. I think that should be, that should be definitely reserved for times when there are legitimately public holidays. But I feel like the whole idea behind toiling Monday to Friday and then enjoying yourself on the weekend is definitely something that's needed for all humans. If you enjoy that kind of thing and enjoying yourself could be just you sitting down with a vodka at home, you reading a book, you going on an extended walk, you whatever everyone's got their own version but that definitely does need to exist but at the heart of it there needs to be a grounding of something real and i feel like once you just frame your entire personality around clubs and around going out you might end up like a nicholas where you essentially are so warped and wrapped in your own reality that you that you just can't see the hypocrisy of what you're kind of saying and i feel like in this entire thing advocating for you know ghb um kind of a you know awareness and you know safety and whatnot without really confessing and being upfront with how badly it's affected you and the way it's kind of impacted your life and the way it's kind of negatively impacted people around you blah de, blah 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 is a little bit disingenuous and essentially just makes me feel like this is a ploy to kind of shift the narrative and change it and kind of become this drug drug advocacy person 
it without even doing the work that needs to be done internally before you step out and do it because in my opinion i would imagine it's just me speaking again me only i can see it from a distance here but if i if it was me i don't think anybody who's kind of you know talking about drug awareness should be talking about it if they haven't you know done the work in terms of being sober from that said drug for a prolonged period of time at minimum it should be a year at minimum but if you're two months deep into your awakening of like oh ghb overuse of it is bad and it can make you into a horrible person and it can ruin your relationships and da, da, da. it doesn't necessarily mean in two months that you've kind of seen everything now and now suddenly now you're an expert and you can kind of preach to others that's really disingenuous and especially for the people out there who are doing ghp responsibly and living a somewhat decent life it happens but there are some of us that can't do this stuff like you know whatever it may be but i feel like the self-denial when this is flipping crazy there are bits in it that just kind of beggars belief but one of the things that really made me laugh was this little exchange here it's in 47 minutes right where um, nicholas rose is talking about one time helping somebody and after hours because i think there's a lot of talk around this podcast around after hours so it feels like gsb maybe because of how long the high is but for whatever reason gsb has become a really big drug in the after hour scene of people going to clubs and then going to and up maybe another club or somebody's home usually maybe an airbnb and partying out throughout the entire day and it's become a real big drug in that kind of scene and you know nicholas kind of touches on one instance where somebody essentially overdosed or maybe had too much and Nicholas was there to comfort them. But I thought this exchange was hilarious because it just kind of shows the hypocrisy of this whole situation and just how crazy this whole interview was in general. Thing. And so I remember sitting down with the girl when she was comatose, rubbing her forehead, and I was saying beautiful things. You're beautiful. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Your body is going to recover. You're the people kept saying, what are you doing? And I'm like, shut up. Get out. I'm like, da, 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 it's going to be all right. An hour later, she wakes up. She's awake, gay. Everyone's like, oh, she's awake. <laughs> it's, it's dark, but, babe, it's real. It's dark, but it's real. It's dark, but it's real. <laughs> and the girl, do you know what she says? She, she stopped the music. Everyone's like, what? She says, you guys are all so fake. Mm. You guys thought I couldn't hear you. Guys, I felt what you guys... It's like a scene out of Gossip Girl, isn't it? Like, press F for doubt, but let's continue guys were saying about me and that was so hurtful nicholas i could feel you were the only one who took care of me am i wrong and i was like oh my god she actually knew what was happening while she was unconscious the words people say are so powerful and they carry so much energy she literally knew people were all saying these things about her because she could feel it in her body when she woke up but she also knew there was someone there to comfort her that whole time she's like i felt like someone was saying something really positive to me during that whole time though wait for at the it, same wait time for it, wait for it, wait for and it. i was like she was like that was you wasn't it and i was like yeah it was it was and, and she were was like, you on g at this time at that point yeah i was but i also still <laughs> at this point <laughs> what this entire i saved this um damsel in distress and after hours one you know one hour into an overdose or a fainting wherever it was in the middle of somebody's apartment the fact that there are pe honestly the fact that there are people in the scene who would willingly just sit with somebody without calling the, the ambulance or whatever medical services and just wait with them to wake up for an hour or whatever it may be is insane in my opinion legitimately if that's a scene you're in because clearly at this point you're not in it for the music you're just in it for the drugs so you essentially you're all drug addicts which is what it is but let's just call it what it is let's not try and disguise it as like oh the scene the scene the scene the scene because i feel like in some is in some sense this could be applied to all drugs i think there's a kind of an over stigmatization of gsb in some instances because it's only really affecting a very small group of people i, I know i know the scene is somewhat big but essentially it's a very small subsect of people and they are legitimate and that small subsect of people there are people within that small sect that are taking it to the extremes that are going way too far with it because i'm sure there are people who are doing it safely and who are enjoying themselves having a good time but some people who are going overboard and ones who are going overboard are the ones who are willing to sit and wait for somebody to get to come to consciousness or whatever to wake up for one hour because they're afraid of the ambulance comes and might get in trouble or whatnot it might ruin their party they'd rather wait for an hour and i'm assuming at that time when she's waking up and they're putting water over her head and you know he's humming whatever he's whatever he's humming you know sweet nothings into their ear that there's probably people in the toilets doing lines at the same time imagine that flipping um that contrast of having somebody comatose right 
um, probably losing color in their face, maybe <laughs> hopefully still breathing, and you're in the co- you're in the toilet, railing lines. Just imagine that. <laughs> but I thought this exchange was hilarious. Were you on just beat that time? Yeah. But look at this. Look at instantly what happens there. A rare moment of introspection, a rare moment of like reflection, and of kind of acknowledging of like the part that you may have played in the situation and how detrimental the entire thing was the fact that this person was laid out and you were there whispering sweet nothings into their ear to make them feel better but you were also high off your head blah 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 all this sort of stuff should be kind of laid bare right to kind of really show the ugly side of things but it's no it turns immediately nick is like no 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 i'm always the hero of my own story and it switches it instantly point was able to reason whether or not I'm on G it's not that I become I actually don't become a nasty person I just become I just was becoming apathetic meaning like it was hard for me to get into my emotions but when there's something like that that is a nasty person who wants to talk to somebody that has no emotions so shocking where I first entered the club uh first entered the party scene here where I was a little where at the time I was much less desensitized to what life and death was so to me I was literally seeing, oh my God, this person could, may not wake up. I gotta do something, I have to be there for her. And through time, I noticed even for myself, it became less, it became less of a shock to me, which is what also- Anyway, whatever, you get the point. So my point in this whole thing is not to bash the Nicholas Rose person, but essentially I think what this could be was a good learning moment for all people, myself included. I think I've come to resolution. I came to this realization, sorry, a long time ago. And I think I was quite lucky because I started in this scene promoting myself or promoting parties and stuff and putting parties on and whatnot. And, you know, having to play because of that, not because I had these big aspirations of becoming an extra Ricardo Bill Lobos. But then over time, my love and appreciation of the scene kind of grew. And then as soon as I started to kind of, you know, because I did this whole weird experiment thing, where I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm getting too wrapped up in the drugs and the drinking. I, but I know that I love this thing because, you know, outside of doing some other things i don't really have any other occasion where i'm social and clubs are the only time where i actually got to meet people do you know posting some clips online you get comments people that want to go out sharing stuff on instagram people will reply back to you sometimes going out and about people will see you out and about if you're out all the time those things kind of added to how i was you know able to maybe kind of gain new friends quote unquote so it was important to me that i was able to get to a point where i felt like I wasn't only going out to do it. I wasn't, I wasn't only going out for an excuse to get high or to get drunk. I needed that to be sure. I need to be sure that was true. So one thing that I did, um, which I was happy that I was able to follow through with, I think a few years or a couple of years, sorry, was I was I went on like a dry January, sober February kind of thing. Like I, I, I think I maybe went into it right up until my birthday around April time. So I kind of did a good four month stint. And in between that time, I did, I went to Berlin, I think, for January or February, one of those months where it was Fashion Week out there or some time of something, some, some some big event happened. I forgot what it was, maybe Fashion Week or something. And at that at that time I went there, I had all the connections of people that I knew out there in the industry who invited me to all these brand events with free drink and stuff. And the moment I was around that sort of stuff and I was under and I understood or that I could see that I didn't have the urge to get how get drunk that's when i knew okay cool i can do this i can be in the scene i can go out i can club i can party without doing those things now don't get me wrong i'm gonna tell you the truth and say clubbing without the ability to drink or do drugs is terrible especially if you that's a, especially if you experienced it on those things it's not like it's great but if you can do it it's really important to do it as often as you can especially if you go out a lot because i feel like going out a lot and doing drugs all the time also it's just not um con- conductive it's not constructive it's not going to be it's not healthy in any way shape or form and in general you don't necessarily get the best out of the experience when you're going out in my opinion i don't think you know, re- you really do i think sometimes going out a few times sober really just get makes you appreciate the music that you're obsessed with listening to in heavens because for the most part when i'm at home or when I'm on a run listening to mixes and stuff, I'm not listening to them drunk or high, I'm listening to them sober. So if you can enjoy them at home, you should be able to enjoy them in a club like that way. So that's a really big part of it. But outside of that, watch this interview, it kind of really did re- reaffirm to me why it's so important to try 
to ground yourself in something real outside of these frivolous things like going to clubs and stuff because you know these are leisurely activities that there are somewhat you know necessary i understand but these kind of extracurricular things that you do should be things that you do on the side but there should be other things that you do in your life day to day that kind of give you a sense of purpose so that you're not trying to frame your entire personality around going out in clubs because to me in my opinion i can't think of anything more um sad in my opinion to be at this person's big age crying and complaining about certain things that happen to you out line trying to you know trying to kind of grasp some level of identity behind it and stuff and trying to advocate for certain things when at the core of it there are issues internally that you kind of have to deal with that have nothing to do with the clubs and maybe the reaction or the kind of expression of that is what has ever happened with the drugs but clearly there is an issue happening out there with drugs because you only have to look at certain forums and whatnot and just go on certain flipping telegrams and see people complaining about punters out there on GHB who are making nights out terrible and driving them mad and whatnot and wanting people to not go to certain places and whatnot I, I certainly think that is definitely an issue and I think for the most part the fact that GHB negative affects people in a weird way where they pass out and stuff and clubs clearly don't want to have that smoke on them already there's an issue in certain countries or certain areas where clubs have a very fraught relationship with local governments and their images aren't the best no one wants to be having people you know be stretched out of their you know venues on stretches every single night every single day because it's going to be a bad image for the club and eventually what's going to lead that's going to actually lead to clubs being shut down because for the most part governments don't really know how to deal with drugs effectively on a safe manner they just kind of do what they do best and just kind of close places down instead of really kind of consulting in ways to kind of sort that out in some sort of reasonable adult way that can kind of mediate and kind of address the issue so that's definitely something that is definitely something you need to kind of keep an eye on but overall i felt like this interview kind of didn't really get to the heart of anything essentially it kind of felt like it was an interview where he kind of was sorry where they tried to frame themselves as this kind of drug advocacy person without having necessarily done the work i think being two months sober doesn't necessarily give you any right to come out and preach and start telling people or start lecturing people to what they should and shouldn't do i feel like if anything maybe there should be a, a sounding alarm that could be a little clip but to sit down for an hour plus talking about the highs and lows of a drug that you just you know are on the way to kind of getting yourself sorted from is really really disingenuous in my opinion especially especially when you consider all of these comments that i've been reading online regarding the person themselves and maybe some of the previous things that they may or may not have done um in the past and again this you take it again with a pinch of salt i don't really know if some of these comments are true or not but these are random comments that i've been pulling from reddit where people have been kind of discussing some of the um issues or s discussing the person at the center of that interview which is Nicholas, and kind of talking about some of the issues that they've been having with them interacting with them in the clubbing space so this is one person says as follows aha uh -huh. This made me sick to see these videos. I remember him, I remember Nicholas, I guess, doing G, 18 years old, with an 18-year-old girl and pushing to take more. And when she was collapsing, he wanted to put some speed up her nose instead to just check on her and let her sleep. By the way, most of the people um, Nicholas was hanging out with was mostly 18 to 19-year-olds discovering drugs and queer scene. So easy audience to manipulate, easy money from. One day I was at a girl's place and Nicholas said he was on his way and the message was like, do you have any juice left? The person said no and he answered two minutes later saying, oh sorry, I can't come anymore. Don't remember the excuse exactly but that was a generic one. This guy is an attention seeker and really toxic person, always looking for service their own interest. He's not, uh, Nicholas is not a close friend, but during the pandemic I met Nicholas a lot and everything about Nicholas uh is a, he needs constant attempt validation with others and if you disagree or dare to challenge their views they will publicly accuse you of racism or homophobia i mean this only happens if you manage to say quote within without being cut off he's they're a great speaker and by the way they doesn't shy away from making nasty remarks about the english of people who don't speak here or was that and doesn't shy nasty remarks about the english or people who don't speak it well as he does in public um he is also extremely brain fucked by the whole techno babe fame who how many followers do you have who do you know to talk to do you have guest lists every little thing is a reason for him to raise drama and everything is related to the skin color if you listen to him actually what he does to rso is so fucked up in my opinion and put so much people in the shit by calling them racist 
the way that he's kicked out a definitely unacceptable and justified complaint or other procedures but raising this theory as racist attack was so fucked up i also remember that he made a story one day of how he was choked after being denied at Bergheim. so clearly there is a lot of um questions question marks around the person's character and um for me these comments aside because there's plenty of them here on the screen as you can see yeah that person can confirm this guy's a scam i know him for a long time through the dance world in the states and in berlin i can confirm he's a narcissist an opportunist and a snake oil salesman he is this really intelligent praise on broken people claiming to be saving voice of change of marginalized groups of people when in reality he just creates drama as stated publicly above he's extremely entitled constantly asking for money for support on a project people believe him support him and then nobody sees any of his claimed projects Fuck scam i could go on for days and that person said i agree instantly dislike the guy from when he cancelled rso um they even give him a job someone says yeah no fucking way so clearly there's issues with this person clearly there's issues there is issues right with their integrity and whatnot there was a person but i felt like there was a really good actually quote here i took i think it's this one right um regarding the issue of ghb and i feel like this maybe is a far more better um sounding alarm in general for the ills of g and for why people should probably stay away from it than maybe what you know nicholas maybe spoke about and how nicholas kind of framed it because it kind of felt like you know nothing really bad did happen it was kind of handled really good i'm a strong person there was loads there, was, there wasn't really a lot of personal responsibility and a lot of real honesty and really bearing of soul in terms of actually getting to the truth of what actually happened and acknowledging some of the mistakes and missteps that that person's done because if it was me and i was talking about stuff you have to you have to be you know excruciate excruciate excruciatingly whatever that word is honest about it and how negative it's affected you because we know i think most of us who go out a lot we know how dark and how bad it can get from you know being a person who says oh, i don't drink at home suddenly you're drinking at home so being a person who says, i don't do stuff for drugs at home suddenly you do drugs at home it can slowly and quickly get to that position just from you going out and being in the scene a lot and not addressing things that are going on in your life that may be affecting you in a way that are making you lash out or kind of reach those things as an outlet to kind of soothe your pain or whatever you're going through my opinion or maybe you see, especially if you're directionless because i feel like a lot of people in the scene and i guess what i've seen here don't have a purpose or are looking for some sort of position you know maybe you're you know you're a struggling dj maybe you're trying to produce maybe you're trying to get involved in the scene and work behind the scene in clubs and whatnot and you're not getting there and sometimes to compensate with that you to kind of feel like you're involved you kind of you know get lapped into this drug community within clubs and you feel like that is a scene in itself and you dress up in a certain way and you dance in a certain way you hang out with certain people and you feel like that's a personality in itself and that's kind of giving you purpose but in the end it's only so you're surely destroying your life but anyway i feel like this person really encapsulates what um how bad ghb can be the person as follows um so i haven't watched the interview yet not sure i need to i've been through the meat grinder hardcore i woke up having to pee still high as hell fell in the hallway right into the hat rack my foot got stuck in it and broke right in the middle crutches for two weeks oh my god i got kicked out of a woman's apartment because i behaved like a piece of trash and almost broke her mirror i fell down the stairs lost consciousness my body blocked the path and i woke up after a tenant had to step over me i had no idea where i was oh my days oh why i had to walk through an unknown part of town without shoes phone ipod and headphones some of the women found the stuff called a friend of mine i picked it up at the police station i looked at them shrugging my shoulders because i didn't know what else to say they seemed to a tad perplexed i collapsed in a coat rack so i collapsed in a coat checks area at Burkine while taking talking to a friend of friends i'm lucky no bouncer was around and the two friends rushed me to the toilets which happens quite often in most clubs in general most it's not just a Burkine issue it's like, oh, Burkine's always you know not really paying attention to people not caring and not looking after their well-being essentially they they don't really have the resources i'm assuming so many people come through that club so people get too fucked up and it's kind of a personal responsibility type of thing i'd imagine also but they generally try to let your friends deal with it and of course if their friends can't deal with it on you on your own you just get chucked out and kind of you have to figure it out on your own that way which can be a bit harsh but i think most clubs do it because you just don't want the heat from local councils even place like berlin which is kind of you know has a very good relationship with clubs in general they even go out of their way to try to make sure that they distance themselves with people who are messed up so you it kind of you're taking a you're taking a calculated risk because you're going to get super messed up you're not going to be aware of your surroundings and you might get separated from your group and it might lead to you getting thrown out without your belongings so 
keep that in mind it continues here um the zenith or let's maybe call it the nadir of my addiction included taking eight millimeters of gbl not gb ghb to sleep waking up one hour 1.5 hours later i'm still sorry one, one hour five later another eight mil and so on if you start to take if you start taking it for sleeping you're royally screwed yeah imagine that that's like doing coke to go to sleep god almighty i went through heavy withdrawals ended up getting the dt's delirium terums emergency room the fact that i'm still alive after things escalated to the point of eight millimeters is really mind-boggling an idiot's luck but i was oblivious to the damage it can and most of the time will do what i still have some but it's not at my place i take a dose or two at burger if someone has it on them and two two or 2.3 mil max that's just enough to give me a nice buzz i'm not proud of anything that happened to me i was ruined it ruined relationships and it almost ruined another i'm telling this as a warning and for me i don't feel like i got any of this sincerity any of this bearing of soul any of this honesty any of this blunt tr you know truth from that entire one hour and 10 minute interview of Nicholas Rose, it felt like a weird political positive spin on things to kind of rewrite the narrative or whatever's going on over there in Berlin. Because again, Playful Magazine is a Berlin publication. So maybe there is conversation around Nicholas in the scene that Nicholas felt like they had to address. And this is a way to address it. I don't really know. But I just feel like as a platform, maybe interviewing somebody on under the guise of sobriety and drug safety awareness, who's only been sober for two months, if that is really negligent in my opinion especially considering all of the bad you know bad vibes and bad anecdotes anecdotal stories around you know nicholas and previous things have happened and whatnot i saw some people in the comments um complaining about the interview and not really grilling nicholas and kind of you know pushing back on certain things i don't really think that's fair i think playful magazine why i really like it for the most part is that it gives people in the scene a platform to speak and to kind of share and kind of talk about their experiences and i feel like sometimes in those kind of arenas it's not really needed to be you know combative or to be inquisitive in that way if you want that you know maybe you do an interview and kind of ask those grilling questions but for the most part you don't really hear from these people some of them try to stay away from press or explain themselves in any kind of way because sometimes the mystique is better than the reality as i said previously before i think most people once they get to know actual DJs will realize that most of them are pretty lame. They're pretty boring. Like the only most interesting thing about them is the fact that they can DJ or produce really well. And I think for the most part, if you are wrapped up in a scene, you're better off trying to find your own way forward, starting your own night, starting your own label, starting your own little thing, than trying to befriend popular DJs. It doesn't really go anywhere, really, for the most part. You know, if it's a girl, they're not gonna fuck you really for the most part because they probably got better options and they don't give a fuck. And if it's a guy, they've got many guys out there who are willing to kind of you know get on their knees you know for a flipping guest spot so you are one of many so just probably focus on your own thing if you actually want to get involved then i feel like having the respect or the acknowledgement of an artist on an artistic point of view should be the thing to go to look for as opposed to trying to be overly fanatic and be a fan of them that way i feel like that's one thing that kind of i feel like makes being into dance music quite cool you can be a fan of somebody without ever wanting to interact with them ever in the slightest like from once you know i'm a big fan of dixon and i love everything that he does in the vision but i don't want to be his friend yeah i just want to fucking enjoy the music i want to be able to go and see him perform live um you know buy some merch here and there maybe if i'm if i'm at the front of the booth i can wave or something that's been amazing but there's no willingness or there's no kind of desire for me to kind of make them to be one of my friends or whatnot so we can hang out and go what restaurants and stuff it doesn't make any sense so maybe a lot of that whole overconsumption of drugs is a kind of again a weird way to kind of feel like you're close to it because you're not really close to it you're not really doing the thing you want to do i'm not really too sure but in general i thought the interview was a little bit it didn't really do anything it didn't really go anywhere um if anything it kind of raised more questions than anything but you know maybe the conversation having it out there in the first place is good for the most part people are going to be talking about it in an honest way and we're going to see where it goes from there but i feel like you know having somebody that's not a year in in their sobriety speaking about it doesn't really make any sense but that's just my opinion anyway that has been the action zing show episode number 645 sorry for taking so long to upload a new one i know it's been a while but you know life takes the better of you but i'm back now doing what i need to be doing so thank you so much again for tuning in and hanging out with me if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you want know to do smash like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening via any other platform 
leave me a five star review especially if you're leading an audio podcast that'd be really really appreciated i think they have that version of a rating system on spotify they also have it on apple so if you can leave me a five star rating that'd be much much appreciated um of course if you listen to the audio podcast you'll hear my tune of the day playing um coming in probably underneath me talking right now and if you're listening or watching sorry via the youtube platform it'll just unfortunately fade to black but if you want any more information regarding myself the links are in the description of course you can do all that good stuff and contact me and i'll be with you guys again very very soon but for now take care be safe peace